Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you. I need to close closer. Okay. <laughs> Uh, good morning again. Uh, thank you, Rana, for the, 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 the nice introduction. And uh, thanks to everybody for, uh, for attending today's session. Um, I'd also like to thank the organizers uh, for the opportunity given to be here in front of you today in this uh, great city of Seoul, uh, home of many innovation uh, in the area of cosmetics. And I'm sure you'll agree uh, a large part of this innovation is also coming from ingredients. And this is this part of the market, the ingredients that I'd like to focus on today. <clears throat> Sorry. So, um, to do so, uh, my, my presentation will be split into four main parts. I will first go very quickly through uh, an introduction to Klein and Company for those of you who do not know us. Um, and I will then look at the market from two angles. First, from a finished product perspective, just as a context information, what's happening, what's the, what's the market of cosmetics globally, uh, what are the key drivers, uh, before then focusing on what I consider to be the main part of my presentation, uh, which are ingredients. I will first look at, an over, uh, at a global view of the ingredient market, and um, we will, in the last part, uh, focus more on the key Western markets, that would be Europe and the United States, and give you the key differences that we see uh, from an ingredient perf perspective uh, between these markets and, and some of the key Asian markets. So let me first start with a quick introduction to Klein & Company. Uh, Klein is a... Klein is a oops, sorry. Uh, is an international uh, market research and consulting company. Uh, our businesses are roughly split into three groups. Uh, we are producer uh, of, of uh, market research reports and databases, uh, so with uh, off-the-shelf uh, available information. Uh, we do also uh, provide our customers with custom research, so for uh, in case some of the information um, our customers will be looking for is not available off the shelf. We have the capabilities to run a uh, more tailored uh, project. And finally, uh, we do have a management consulting team that is building on our expertise built uh, within the markets we're covering with our market research reports and that work with more strategic uh, oriented projects. Uh, we're a truly global company, nine offices uh, worldwide, companies headquartered in the US three offices in Europe and three offices, um, or four offices actually, in, uh, in Asia, two in India, uh, one in Shanghai, and one in Tokyo. We, um, I, 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 just a quick word about our methodology, and that will explain how we get the figures that you will see in some of the slides uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be sharing with you. Um, we massively invest uh, in primary research, which is uh, basic, consisting in face-to-face um, -face or phone uh, discussions, uh, open discussions with people directly involved in the markets we're covered at different places of the, of, the, of the value chain. Uh, so when we cover the, the market of ingredients for cosmetics, we'll discuss with, uh, uh, with, with the suppliers of those ingredients, we'll discuss with distributors, we'll discuss with formulators to understand their point of view. And it's really the mass of information we gather from those, uh, from those interviews that would be the base for our market analysis. Um, and that's, that's what we think is our key, key, key strength and allow us to, have, uh, to offer an extensive uh, series of global market research in the areas we're focused on. That would be specialty chemicals, that would be consumer goods, agrochemicals and, and energy products. Um, we, uh, our key strength is definitely the, our, our, our global team of, of experts. Uh, within their, their industry, that they're well known by the industry uh, and they're committed to, to this industry. Uh, and finally, we do also work with a, a global network of industry experts, uh, which, uh, which are uh, very often um, working for decades in the, the industries we are covering. A last introductory slide before I get to the, 
main content of my presentation. Uh, and this, uh, this, is, this slide is representing the, the personal care value chain. From on the left, the basic chemical suppliers, uh, down to the, to the consumer on the far right of this, uh, of this chart. Um, another strength we, 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 we have at Klein is that we do cover this entire value chain. Uh, my colleagues that are working in the consumer business cover uh, the purple side of the, so the, the purple part of that chart that's on the right side. Um, with, with studies about retail channels, about distributors, and about consumer trends. Um, I'm responsible for the chemical business of the company, and I'm looking only at the chemical side of things, which would be in blue in this, uh, in, on this chart, uh, from basic chemicals through, uh, through, through um, specialty chemicals uh, down, t down to, uh, to the formulators. So that was for the introduction. Uh, I'd now like to, to get started with, first of all, a very quick look, because that will not be my focus. But uh, still, I think it's in important to put, uh, to put in some context information about uh, what is the global beauty market and what are um, its defining trends. So when we speak about uh, the beauty markets, um, we are speaking about a, a market that is valued at around 400 to 450 billion uh, US dollars at a retail level. So it's a very sizable market, obviously, a uh, very important market. Uh, not only it is large, but it is also uh, pretty, pretty nicely. Sorry. Oh, oh sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Here I am. Uh, so, the large market, 400 to 450 billion dollars, large growth market with a uh, market that, um, uh, that's annually growing uh, between 3.5 and 4.5%, at least that's, some, that's what we're forecasting until 2020. Um, and this growth is, uh, is interesting because it's very sustainable. Um, it's sustainable because it's based on sustainable uh, drivers, demographic, aging populations. So there's no reason really uh, that, that the, grow, uh, that the, the growth uh, could be affected. Uh, and we've seen that notably a decade ago, where when the, the most of the countries in the world were hit um, by the financial crisis, um, where, of course, uh, the personal care industry was uh, affected as well, but uh, nowhere close to where some more cyclical industries were, <coughs> and, and basically uh, the, 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 the industry resisted very well, very well to the crisis. So this, the, the fact that it is a less uh, cyclical um, industry than, than many others is also an interesting point of this, uh, of this industry. So um, we were speaking uh, of of markets, and sorry because I don't have the same uh, thing on the screen that I have on your screen. So uh, okay, <laughs> sorry for that. <coughs> so we're speaking about a, a 400 to 450 billion market. How does it split in terms of? Hmm. Okay, so back in trouble. Okay. Uh, how is that, does it split by uh, segments? Get a better, bit better, uh, a finer understanding of the market. So we're looking at, on the left, uh, the global split by segments. And what we, we see right away is that the first and the largest part of the market is represented by skincare products. <coughs> it's followed by, by hair care. And what you can see is that those two segments together represent about 50% of the global market value. So it's definitely those. Uh, where, where uh, that concentrate most, most of the market value. Um, if you look at the most important skincare segment and you, you zoom in to see what is, what is inside, uh, you'd see that facial treatments represent by far the largest segments. We're speaking about about three quarters of that market. Uh, so again, uh, very, very sizable and important segments. And finally, if you zoom in further into this facial treatments area, what you'll find out 
is that anti-aging is a key segment. So if you look at anti-aging facial treatments in skincare, that's where a lot of the market value is concentrated. And so that was the market size. Now, if we look at the market growth and the, the growth we're expecting for those different segments, it shows another interesting thing. So you have a, a personal care market globally, uh, globally growing between three and three and a half, four and a half percent, as we said before. Um, but if you look at those at the growth expected for the different segment, you'll first see that skincare is growing faster than the market average. That facial treatment is growing faster than skincare, and then anti-aging facial treatment is growing faster than than facial treatment, than skincare, and then personal care. So really, that large part I showed you in the previous slide is just going to be larger and larger because it's it's the one that's not only is the largest, but it's also the one that has the most rapid growth. So this was this were uh, I would say some of the key uh, key data points uh, that I, w I wanted to present you as a context information. Now, if we look um, at at more qualitative information at the, at the key trends, what I've put on this slide are the, what we consider to be the ten defining trends in 2016 when it comes to the uh, to the beauty industry. So you you'll see I'll not read them all of them because uh you know we'll we'll uh, spend a lot of time doing so uh but there's a few of them that I wanted to uh to underline because I think they're interesting first of all what we've seen um is that a lot of uh, of trends affecting the market were uh basically trends that um that had to do with color cosmetics for instance you see the the makeup free movement see the male makeup uh, movement um, or the, the bold and beautiful. Uh, all, all of, of these are trends that are really um, affecting mainly the makeup, uh, the, the makeup area. And a lot of movement uh, in the last year, uh, or, or a lot of uh, hype on the market uh, had to do uh, with this, this segment of, uh, of color cosmetics. Another interesting uh, trend uh, is the, the natural trend. So uh, interesting, I say interesting because we've, we've heard it so much, so for, for so long now, uh, our natural is the key trend, is the key driver for more than a decade. Interestingly, um, this is still a driving force in the market. Uh, and after all these years, you, you still have the uh, the move to 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 our the highest potential for growth for natural products for natural ingredients is still a defining factor of the market. It is not changing, even uh, if even if it's an old trend, it's still it's it's still a key driving force. <coughs> Finally, two two more that I wanted to um, to point out on this slide and. Uh, and that I think are, are pretty uh, linked together. Um, the investments that have been done, quite uh, that significant investment done in the, in, the, in the industry last year, uh, and the fact that consolidation, consil, consolidation sorry, continues. Uh, and um, so that's more on the supply side of the, uh, of the market. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, in, uh, it's reshaping of, of the supply landscape is an interesting point to note. So that was, I'd say, overall trends. Uh, I, I wanted to finish this uh, over overview of the finished product market by looking at, uh, at three niches that uh, my colleagues from the consumer goods are covering, uh, three <coughs> niches part of the market that will show basically the importance of Asia in the global market. And uh, we're looking at professional skincare products, we're looking at professional nail care products, and we're looking at uh, another uh, segment of the beauty industry uh, when we speak about beauty devices. And what we see on those three segments is that, so first of all, if we look at professional skincare, which is probably the largest of the three, Asia is the most important country globally. 
uh, it's, it's, it's larger uh, than Europe, that is the second uh, most important region, and followed by the US. On the device area, uh, the North America and the United States is the larger market, but it's followed by, by Asia, which represent higher potential, um, higher turnover than, than Europe. Uh, and finally, uh, when it comes to professional nail, nail care, um, Asia is number three um, after the United States and, um, and Europe. So a key, a key role notably in professional skin care and in beauty devices for, for Asia if you compare it to the more uh, major uh, Western markets. We'll be looking a bit more in detail into those, those uh, two of those three segments, uh, namely professional skin care and beauty devices. So. Um, if you look at the professional skincare, that's what we're looking here. Uh, so the, uh, on, the on, on the left, this pie chart shows you um, the regional split uh, for professional skincare product at the retail level in value. <coughs> and you'll see that China is, is by far the largest, the largest country for uh, professional skincare products. So that is uh, obviously a key market, more than a quarter of the global market, followed by, the, by Europe and the United States. Uh, in terms of growth, on the, on the right here, uh, China is growing uh, slower than, than most of, of, of these markets. Uh, this is mainly due to the fact that being the leading market, obviously, it can grow as fast as Brazil, uh, which represents a much smaller share. A quick word about devices. Again, devices, Asia was the second largest uh, uh, consuming country in the world. And I wanted to show you a bit uh, some information uh, about, uh, about different countries in Asia and how they're... Um, wait a second. And how they're performing. Um, so we have Japan, which is uh, represent the highest growth potential in the region for devices. Uh, that is followed by China. Also, very high potential for growth. We're speaking about double-digit growth. And finally, Korea, third, third growing country in the region, but still uh, a very large uh, potential for growth for, uh, for Korea. I'm just waiting a second. At least it gave me the opportunity to have a bit of water. Um, so that was for the, the overview of, of the ingredients market. And again, this was more to give you a context to what uh, I want to be the focus of my presentation, which are ingredients. I'll first start with uh, an overview of the ingredients market. And with this slide uh, showing you how do we consider <coughs> the, the ingredient market uh, to be structured uh, and the size of it. So, cosmetic ingredients, personal care ingredients, we're speaking about a, a market that's globally valued at about $22 billion and that you would roughly split into three categories, um, rather commoditized ingredients, specialty ingredients, and active ingredients. You could say to me, well, active ingredients are specialty ingredients, and they are. Uh, they're the most specialty from the specialty ingredients, but they're totally different markets. So I, I wanted to um, consider them separately. Commodity ingredients still represent a quite large uh, piece of the, of the market, actually uh, slightly more than, than half of it. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, uh, it's, it's the, the lowest, uh, uh, they also represent the lowest growth potential. So they, we don't consider that market to be the most, the most interesting from a growth perspective point of view, uh, but we rather uh, focus on, on specialties and, and active ingredients. Um, a few words about those markets. First of all, how would the uh, question we, we often get is how do you define uh, a commodity versus a specialty? And there's no uh, uh, straightforward definition for that because uh, you could speak with, with uh, 50 people and get 50 different uh, answers on what's a commodity versus what's a specialty. Uh, what we consider to be the simplest uh, definition that's pretty robust is that a commodity is a product that's sold to specification, uh, while a specialty is a product that's sold on performance. Um, 
obviously an active ingredient is also sold on performance, but more than that, uh, selling an active ingredient requires mo most of the time to sell a concept and not only, uh, not only an ingredient. A few key differences between those three markets, while the, 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 the expected growth uh, for the commodity is pretty low, uh, it gets to moderate to high for uh, specialties, uh, up to high growth potential for, uh, for active ingredients. Uh, when you look at the market and the customer fragmentation, uh, it goes from pretty low for the commodities up to very high, actually, uh, for, uh, for, for active ingredients. And uh, Similarly, for the service and R&D intensity, um, low for the, for, for the commodities. Um, people that are buying commodities are not expecting a lot of associated services with those, those ingredients, uh, while it's the other way around when it comes to, to, to active ingredients, uh, and notably when it comes to, to, uh, to, to the R&D part of it. I will discuss a bit more now on, on the two segments um, that I presented. So the specialty segments that was representing about 40% 40, uh, 40, 40, 40 of the market, <clears throat> uh, a bit more 42, I think, and, and then the active ingredient too. Um, I'm starting with the, with the specialty, and I'll get back to this, the active ingredient piece a bit later in my presentation. When we speak about specialty, so we're speaking about products that are sold on performance, as I was mentioning before, and what we, uh, what we actually cover uh, under this category are about 150 ingredients um, that are grouped into eight, eight categories that more or less cover most of the function you'll find in the in cosmetic formulations. So you'll find antimicrobials with products like parabens or CIT, MIT, you'll find emollients, uh, you'll find surfactants, UV absorbers, conditioning polymers. So really a very wide variety of, of products here. And <clears throat> again, a quick view at the global market before uh, getting a bit closer to, uh, to US and Europe versus Asia later. Um, so we're speaking about look, looking at specialty ingredients uh, and not including the active ingredients, we're looking at a market that's at uh, slightly over $9 billion in 2016. Uh, and what's interesting to see is that you have three in ingredient categories that are really dominating and that represent most of the value uh, of the market. There would be surfactants, would be emollients, and conditioning polymers. Actually, emollients is the largest I should have started with, uh, with emollients. Uh, and then uh, you see smaller markets for, for other categories, but no nonetheless, significant markets, so from, for real energy modifiers, for UV absorbers, for antimicrobials, um, there's no, no really uh, insignificant market. Emollient surfactants and conditioning polymer, uh, however, do dominate in terms of market value, and it's, it is due to, um, if, you, if you recall, when I was speaking about the finished product markets, I was showing you the, 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 the large importance of skin care and, and hair care segments. Well, if you, uh, if you think about it and think about the fact that uh, most of skincare product will, uh, will have an emollient, uh, it explains you why the emollient is very important. Um, a lot of uh, uh, both hair care and skin care products um, will include surfactants. So that's why you'll find surfactants at the second place here. And finally, uh, a lot of hair care products do include and, uh, uh, in their formulation a conditioning polymer uh, and a lot of skincare products too, which basically gives you the importance of the, uh, of the, the which is one of the key reasons of the importance of, of, of the conditioning polymers in this category. Um, a fourth one is a quite interesting one. I'll get back to it in my, in my, in my next slides. Um, is the rheology control agents. While this was a few years back, a uh, rather stable uh, market, uh, there is a uh, sizable still. But it's the fourth largest market. If we look at this, we're at, uh, at, at roughly a roughly billion dollars if we look at, at this pie chart. Um, but there is a the texture, uh, the texture trend that came on the market and had very important impact on and redynamized the, the market of, of rheology control agents. We were looking at the consumption side of things, 
a quick look at how the uh, the supply side of things where you'll find uh, a pretty fragmented market uh, of ingredients, of specialty ingredients globally, uh, with companies, uh, but the, the top 10 companies representing uh, about 40% of the, of the market. Uh, that's already quite fragmented, but if we are looking in the all other categories, you'll find hundreds of, uh, of, of suppliers. So uh, rather, even after all the consolidation that happened on this market, rather, rather fragmented market, notably if you look at, uh, if you compare it to other, uh, other chemical segments. So you'll have three types of companies supplying to this market. Uh, you'll first have the, the, the large multinational companies with a very wide portfolio, so that would be, uh, that would be the, the BSF, that would be Croda, Ashland, Solvay, Clarion. Those companies are pretty large, uh, the large companies, and they have pretty wide portfolio. Uh, that's the first category. Second category, uh, you'd find also multinational companies, but that rather than, than supplying ingredients from a lot of different categories, would rather focus on one, of the, uh, one or two of, of the categories of ingredients I showed you before. Uh, that would be uh, the case for Dow Corning, that we uh, still considered separately uh, in 2016. That's uh, obviously uh, part of uh, Dow now. Uh, it would also be the case uh, of Lubrizol, that is, uh, that, that is really focused on, on the rheology uh, controllers. So uh, that second part, uh, that's the second family, I'd say, of suppliers uh, with people that are pretty, uh, pretty focused on, on, on a family of product. And then you have a third category um, where we don't, you don't necessarily see them on this slide because most of them will be in these all other categories, and that would be uh, rather the regional and local suppliers, and that's where you'd find the, 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 the very large market, market fragmentation. So that was the overview of the global market. I will now focus on, on the Western market, US and Europe, and try to, sh to show you some key differences with, uh, with the, the Asian, some of the key Asian markets. First of all, um, this slide shows uh, the, the regional split. Again, we're still speaking about that 9.2 billion, 9 .2 billion market for specialty ingredients. So um, you need, and this is showing you the importance of Western markets versus, uh, versus others, uh, and shows you that definitely Europe and US are still the key consumers of specialty ingredients globally for a few reasons, ma mainly two. One being that they're uh, historically the largest market globally, um, the second, second reason is that compared to some, uh, some say newer market or more developing markets, um, they're much more, much more specialty oriented. So uh, if we were looking at Europe and US, the share of commodities would be lower um, than, than in some of the other countries on this pie chart. If you look at uh, Asian countries now, um, obviously without uh, much surprise, China would be the largest consumer. Um, Japan, Southeast Asia, and India uh, are also uh, significant, uh, significant consumers. We do not have uh, Korea, unfortunately, because we didn't cover uh, Korea uh, as such, but it's included in the rest of the world. We consider uh, it to be similarly size, uh, sized than, than India or Southeast Asia. So Asia is pretty small. Uh, if you compare it to Europe and United States, but uh, so if you take those out, if you take the two large historical market out, well, Asia represents fifty percent of the market left. So it's it's not it's definitely not uh, a small a small marketplace. Now this is a static view. If we're looking in terms of growth of growth sorry growth potential, Europe and U.S. being major markets are uh, having uh, uh, much lower growth, and I think I'm getting to it a bit uh, later in my presentation, but uh, lower growth than other countries, uh, and notably countries like China, India, Southeast Asia, where, uh, where we often see um, growth that are as, uh, as high as twice uh, the growth you'd find in Europe or the United, the United States. In terms of, I showed you the, the global market and how it's split by categories. I'm, I'm showing you the same by region now to, to show you some uh, uh, 
similarities and differences between, between the Western markets and Asian markets. And what you can see, so we have Europe and US on the, on the left. I've chosen to show you China and Japan here on the right. Um, well, first of all, what you'll see is that the three key categories, surfactants, emollients, and conditioning polymers, are the three key categories everywhere. So that's the key similarity. And, and if you look at the colors, you say, well, they're not so different. Uh, of course, they cannot be totally different, but you can spot a few, uh, a few interesting uh, differences. First of all, you would, you'd find out that uh, if you compare to, to, uh, to Europe, the, the share of surfactants in US, China, and Japan is smaller. Uh, it's not necessarily meaning that uh, there's less surfactant consumed in those markets, uh, but it's probably showing that we're covering only specialty surfactants. We're not covering all surfactants. Products like SLS, SLES are not considered by us as specialty, so we're not con considering them. Uh, and it means that those uh, specialty surfactants we are covering are probably largely used in Europe, and therefore, on the overall, uh, they have a, a large share. Another interesting difference is uh, if you look at the conditioning polymers, uh, you'll find a much larger sh uh, share in Europe, China, and Japan, in, uh, sorry, in the US, China, and Japan than you'd find in Europe. And that's notably due to the, to the, to the fact that um, uh, conditioning hair care products are much more used in those, in those countries. You'd see also a few diff different uh, things, and a large share of, of uh, antimicrobials in, in China, where uh, it's a challenge uh, to, to preserve formulations where um, uh, notably due to the, to the, to the climate, uh, which would explain this uh, larger, larger share of, of, of antimicrobials. And last one I wanted to mention is about the, the category of rheology control agents, where you'd see that uh, Europe, US, uh, Japan is, is, is closer to Europe and US when it comes to the, the relative importance of, of rheology modifiers. Um, uh, where, and there's, they're slightly less important in China. And that's uh, really uh, due to, uh, to the part uh, about sensory benefits um, that I was discussing, uh, discussing before, and notably the texture part of it. So sensory, uh, that's a, a very uh, trendy, trendy word for a few years now in the, in the beauty industry. Um, when we speak about sensory, we're speaking about mainly two, two, two different uh, factors. Uh, the first one is fragrance, second one is uh, texture. Uh, and well, while uh, fragrance is pretty straightforward, it's uh, usually, uh, usually one, one key ingredient that would uh, give, uh, give the fragrance to your, 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 and, uh, to your formulation. When you speak about the texture, it's a bit more complex because here there's a, a, a lot of different ingredients that have an impact on the, on the texture. And this, is, uh, so this tex texture uh, the importance of texture is a key defining trend for ingredients because they have, a, they have had a, a very important impact on, on different categories of products, obviously on emollients, but also on rheology modifiers, uh, on emulsifiers, and, and they've, um, they've also, uh, all, very often been a challenge to, to formulators um, because changing one ingredient can have a dramatic impact on, on the overall texture of, of your formulation. Now, we, we, we were looking at, at the market per ingredient category. Now, we're looking at the market of ingredients per application. Again, trying to compare Europe and US on the left with, uh, with some Asian markets. So here we have Japan, China, India, and Southeast, Southeast Asia. Uh, to see that, again, those, the markets are more similar than they are different, uh, but you can spot a, a few differences. So skincare in purple is the key market in, in, in most of these markets. Uh, hair care is slightly slow, uh, smaller. This is in blue, and then you have other categories in uh, green on the top of the, uh, the, bar, the bar chart. The key differences here between the markets would be <coughs> the slightly uh, larger consumption of uh, hair, hair care ingredients in, uh, in, um, in China and Japan. But again, really, uh, the, the, the main uh, learning from this slide is that the, the markets, um, Western markets versus Asian markets, are more uh, similar than they are different when it comes to the key applications. 
Where the large difference is actually uh, is on the growth side of things, and that's what I'm showing you here. With the growth we're expecting for the specialty ingredients market um, until 2020, uh, and that's where you can see that we have a global market for ingredients that's growing uh, at about 3%, slightly below 3%. Don't forget that this is largely uh, impacted by the very large size of Europe and US too. And if you look at the top performers of the countries that we're expecting um, to, to, to gain uh, the, the, the largest uh, market value, um, you'd find China uh, with a growth at almost 6%. You'll find India uh, very close uh, with a growth between 5 and 6%. You'll find Southeast Asia uh, growing significantly over average uh, at uh, more than 4%. Uh, and then uh, if you compare to Europe and US, uh, there, there'll be slightly below uh, global average growth, uh, between 2 and 3%, US a bit uh, slightly faster than expected than, than Europe. And on the bottom of the list, you'll find Brazil and Japan. Brazil due to um, not so, so um, I'd say, great macroeconomics uh, and economic situation in the country. Um, Japan more, uh, more due to, to the, to, to the uh, extreme maturity of the market. If then you look a bit closer to, um, to the, the growth that, uh, you, that we're expecting, you'll find other differences that, uh, that are worth noting and shows a, a few key differences uh, between Asian markets and, and Western markets. So here what I'm showing is the difference of growth expected between synthetic ingredients and natural ingredients. So synthetic ingredients are in blue. Uh, and natural ingredients in um, purple. On a global level, natural ingredients are expected to grow slightly faster than synthetic ingredients. Uh, but what you can see, and that, that's a situation you'll find in the US and in Europe, notably in the US where the, the difference is pretty large. Uh, in China, however, uh, synthetic ingredients are still expected to grow faster than, than, their, um, uh, than their natural counterpart. In the U.S., what's driving the growth of, of, of uh, natural ingredients? Uh, it's notably the natural oils, natural gums, as uh, real energy modifiers, uh, or things like uh, green surfactants. I'm getting uh, very close to the end of my time, so um, I'll just get a bit quicker. I wanted to discuss a bit or so about that last piece of the market that is about the active ingredients I was showing you at the, uh, at the beginning of my presentation. And when you speak about active ingredients, what, we are, what are we speaking of? We're speaking about those six categories. That's how we segment the market at Klein, uh, and that's, I, I, I think, uh, how the, the industry itself would segment the market. We're looking at six categories from the very uh, popular botanicals uh, and biotechnology, uh, protein and peptide to bit smaller enzyme and coenzyme, marine ingredients, and, and other synthetic actives that would be mainly uh, vitamin derivatives. Um, uh, important point, all the figures you will see are only for active ingredients that would come with uh, substantiation. So um, if, uh, if we look at a non or unsubstantiated uh, botanical extract, this is not considered by us as an active ingredient. And the market now, how, how this market is splitting by region is as follow. Um, I was showing you a 1.6 billion market globally, and this chart is 1.1 billion. That's because uh, we're just looking at the four countries we've covered in detail uh, in a study we've published earlier this year, Europe, US, China, and Brazil. And what you can see here is that the, the, the importance of Europe and US is even more important uh, than it was for other ingredients. Well, not all the countries are covered, but still, Europe and US are very important when it comes to, uh, to active ingredients. There were most of, of uh, historically, well, product historically formulated with active ingredients were, uh, but there are also the, more, the, the most major markets. Um, China, uh, notably, and I will show you this in a second, has a much larger growth potential. If we look at how the market of active ingredients is structured in the different regions, here you'd see quite key differences uh, between the two the, the regions. Um, botanicals are the key categories in both Europe and, and the United States, followed by biotechnology products. And then you have the third category is about proteins and peptides, where you'd have uh, synthetic peptides, notably. In China, uh, quite differently, biotechnology products 
are by far the largest market. This is due notably to a pretty large availability of some um, fermentation products in China, um, for, for instance, uh, hyaluronic acid or beta-glucans that are, that are easily available in China and that are, uh, that are very often uh, giving uh, moisturizing properties, uh, which are uh, very much uh, seeked in, uh, in, in, in the country. In terms of growth, this is what I was mentioning before. Um, very large Europe and US market. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, pretty interesting growth. We're, we're speaking uh, uh, about growth that are in the 4 to 5% uh, per annum range, which is faster than, than other type of ingredients. But still, compared to China, which is, OK, still a, a much smaller market, but that's where the growth is, a very solid uh, double-digit growth uh, that we consider to be 18% actually until 2021. And I'm getting to the end of my presentation. I just wanted to give you uh, a few words about the, the studies and the reports, the, the, the data I've showed you have, have uh, been uh, sourced from. So this is our uh, report um, on the specialty ingredients uh, that we've, uh, we've published uh, last year. Um, and that's uh, mainly a database product where we have consumption supply data, about more than 150 uh, 50 ingredients on the global coverage uh, with, uh, with fine granularity uh, available by regions. And then I've here, um, that's our report on specialty ingredients, on active ingredients, sorry, active ingredients that we're covering separately because, as I said, they're relatively different market. Um, this is a report we've published earlier this year. And finally, a few reports that my colleague from the consumer team are publishing. Those are the professional skin care, professional nail care, and beauty device. I think I'm right on time. Uh, I hope we have a few minutes uh, for a few questions. I hope you found this, uh, this, in this presentation interesting. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any of your questions now, uh, or you can Feel free to reach out to me by email. My email address is here. And as uh, Arana said, the presentation will be available online after the event. Thank you very much for your attention.